puts us all together. Yay. I just want to welcome everybody again coming out tonight. Um, another uh, interesting panel, interesting discussion, lots of good questions. But to make all this possible, we've been able to pull together a number of sponsors to not only support the pizza, but the facility and to make all of this possible. So to begin with, we'd like to thank Microsoft. They've provided us with these amazing conference rooms. They've been a huge supporter for the disruptive technologists. In addition, Microsoft Reactor, which provides us with the food and the pizza and the sodas and the giveaways. We have giveaways later on, so hang around for those. Um, they're developing community hubs, networking and collaboration. For those of you willing to stay at the end of the program, Sep Demeglio? Sep. Sep will, Sep will give you much more detailed information about Microsoft Reactor. Um, and he'll also be giving away, what are we giving away tonight? Hoodies. Goodies. Hoodies. Hoodies. Reactor hoodies. OK, Reactor hoodies. OK. Um, additionally, McCarter & English, you may have seen the sign outside. McCarter & English is a full service legal firm uh, that's uh, worldwide operations. But they're a big focus of the people involved with us are helping new companies new organizations meet their legal needs and build their organization properly so that they can grow and become the next Google, hopefully. Uh, a long, long time sponsor, Hint Water. They've been with us from very much the beginning. Uh, natural Essence Water with and without bubbles. Some of you found the ones with bubbles. I've heard you open them and scream as it, I guess they're still a little warm. Um, we want to thank them as well. Uh, Dana, who is a longtime sponsor and was actually a member of the organization for a long time until she moved to Milwaukee, um, she supplies, uh, she provides the wine, so we'll thank Dana for that. Um, Visiotag, our videographers. Visiotag back here, if you look in the back, they're videotaping this right now. Visiotag will videotape your events, your whatever you would like to do, and then they will index it with tags to whomever, whatever in there so that you can jump through the video to the sec section that you want to see that you need to see at that point in time. And they're very good about doing that. They will also take existing video that you have, and they will enhance it, improve it, and tag it if you'd like to do that. So the guys in the back will help you with that. They have a table um, out in the foyer. Please talk to them if you have that kind of service needs. OK, and uh, finally, uh, we'd like to thank Oliver for moderating again, and uh, we've got here the Disruptive Technologist Genius Moderator. So you've made it to the genius level, how's that? Um, and he's also co-founder of Movin AI. And with that, Oliver, take it away. Fantastic, thank you. Well, everyone, welcome. Welcome to another Disruptive Technologies. And uh, I have a fantastic panel with us today. Um, we're going to be talking about AI and the impact on jobs. So uh, we can think about how many people in this room are going to have a job in a year or five years. So without further ado, um, uh, let's go through the panelists. But before we do that, we have a disclaimer. <laughs> we have a disclaimer for a good reason. It's not because the lawyers jumped on me. It's because I want this to be a really open conversation. I want us to be able to talk about the things that matter in our society with our technology. So if you quote someone from tonight, keep this in mind. They are talking on their own behalf. They're not representing a company. Because this way, I can ask more interesting questions, and you can ask more things. So <clears throat> without further ado, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves, because they know their background the best. Uh, and let's start with Bjorn. Hi, uh, Bjorn Ostrad. I currently work for IBM for a client team that's dedicated to a one very large financial services institution. Previously, I was in Watson for two and a half years in the Wild West days of Watson, and previous to that uh, in the strategy team, and then many, many other jobs before in Silicon Valley, mostly uh, Northern California, Southern California. It's my third bubble, AI, and uh, I'm originally from Austria. Uh, I'm Gail Brewer. I'm the Manhattan Borough President. I was on the City Council in New York for 12 years. 
the reason that I think I'm here is I did pass the open data bill in 2011 and 12, and as you know, all 80 city agencies now have to put all their data on a uh, platform, open data platform, and it's made a big difference. We in our office now work with Beta NYC, a nonprofit, and we work to try to get all 12 community boards in Manhattan, there are 59 of them uh, citywide, to use the data so that in our neighborhood, we can know what is going on and we can plan. I love this data, but it's not so easy to use sometimes. And for instance, if you live on 12th Street, you don't care what goes on 125th Street, let alone Brooklyn Block that mile. So the idea is how do you use this data to improve, improve people's lives and plan for their lives? That's what I do. Yeah, your mic was Mine wasn't either. Mine's on. Which one should I use? Take your pick. I'm going to use this one. Uh, my name is Luke Schantz. I'm a developer advocate with IBM. Uh, and what an advocate is, is where it's like the new evangelist. We're not sales. We're not marketing. We're not advertising. We're really working one-on-one -on -one with engineers, sometimes making content, but a lot of times face-to-face, -face, and really trying to help people use technology. Uh, my background is in entertainment technology. My family used to manufacture entertainment lighting. And then later I went on to do like a, a design uh, entertainment career where I did stuff like Blue Man Group and like visual effects. And then I got onto doing like um, advertising agency kind of stuff and then did a startup. And through that startup, I got recruited by Softlayer, who IBM bought. And then it just worked out well that they, they found a job for me. Hi, I'm Seth. Demeg Leo. I am a developer audience manager at Microsoft. My team at Microsoft is called the Developer Audience Team. And so essentially, we work a lot with all of the teams at Microsoft who are focused on developers, so like the cloud advocates. And there's lots of names that I won't get into. But uh, there's like 12 or 13 different teams in the US that are all focused on developers. And my team kind of helps facilitate and distribute all of the resources and the content and the trainings and all that to all of the developers in the community. Um, my background is in, I started off doing independent consulting for design and development um, across New York City. And then I was actually a Microsoft student partner while I was in university prior to doing that. and. Uh, my manager met me in that program, and then she recruited me later. So that's how I ended up at Microsoft. And it's been fun. Fantastic. Thank you. Great advert. So without further ado, oh, well, this is me, but easy enough. So without further ado, we have three questions for the panel tonight. And they're centered on AI, jobs, and what's happening next. So the first question, and this is to everyone on the panel, and partly thinking about your own background that helps you to get to where you are. What advice would you give students today, what they should be studying, what's important, um, what's, what's, what's next? Bjorn. Simple question, right? Simple, <laughs> simple question. Um, I think the, the best advice I could give is to learn how to learn. Uh, because we're absolutely positively sure that we don't know what the top 10 jobs will be 10 years from now. Uh, so uh, there is certainly disruption already happening in a lot of different professions that are n new to disruption that were more uh, guaranteed tickets to a middle class or upper class lifestyle. And um, the, the d disruption, for example, in the legal profession is new, is powered by AI and machine learning is hitting people that are not used to being automated away or being augmented with automation. And you know, if you ask the welder in Ohio, they are much more familiar with what that feels like. It's coming now to net new professions. Uh, I think there, is a, there certainly is a disruption. There will be jobs that will be replaced. That is a guaranteed fact. At the same time, a lot of net new jobs are being created. And uh, the top professions of the late 2020s, we don't know yet. Right? Just like in 1995, there weren't any webmasters or e-commerce specialists, uh, although those become very, very profitable professions later. And w we see a little bit of that now, where um, the, for example, there's in one of the major banks in the US, 
there's a vice president or senior vice president of ontology engineering, which many people, including myself, wouldn't have known what that is even you know <laughs> a year ago. And those are examples of new emerging professions that are uh, they have huge potential, are well paid, uh, and are replacing and you know replacing in some pockets, displacing and augmenting existing professionals. Um, on the lower end of the educational scale, there are new professions emerging now that are replacing the formerly outsourced technical support work in the Philippines and India, for example. And those are about tagging data so machine learning models can <coughs> learn better, right? So you need humans to tag the data. So th those are the, what should you learn? Learn how to learn because you're you will need to change professions probably five or 10 times in your career. And we're very poor at predicting the black swans. We just know there's coming. A lot of them are coming. So I'm going to put you on the spot. What CV would impress you for your team? What, what's, the, what's the one thing at the moment for someone in the audience to write in their CV? Or Somebody, a sure. And, and actually, I have a, a good buddy, a workout buddy, and he, he's a younger fella. And he said, well, I'm studying philosophy, political science, but I also know how to code Python. I said, you're doing exactly right. Gail, you're, uh, you're center to the shift that's happening, and it's quite a big shift. Um, how do you look at Manhattan? It is a big shift. Um, it, is, it is a big shift. I actually teach at Hunter College uh, one uh, course. So the students do ask me, you know, how do I uh, create the best CV, and what am I going to do, et cetera. I would say. So that's one group, and I would say for the folks who are um, studying general studies, so to speak, that what they don't know, uh, learning to learn is a good way to, to discuss it, but they have, don't read anything except what they're comfortable with. In other words, they don't look at a variety of news sources. It's just if they're liberally oriented or if they're conservatively oriented, they stick to that venue, and that's a mistake. You've got to be broader in what you think the world is or what you're not sure about. So that's one thing I would suggest is don't limit your viewing to one aspect of the world, because that's what they do. The second is, there's another group of students. My friend is teaching very successfully young people who are disabled in one way or another, either on the spectrum or in a wheelchair, et cetera. And the cybersecurity jobs, after a couple of years, are very available to them. And so that's a group of people. The disabled are actually the poorest group of Americans in terms of their income. 70% are unemployed. So the notion that this technology is opening up jobs to them is actually very exciting. And it is happening, and they're getting jobs, and people like Microsoft are hiring. And then the third group was in the Times over the weekend. Um, a, a two young men in Queens have started a nonprofit very successfully. And they're taking people out of the prison system and out of NYCHA. And in two years, uh, as you can imagine, thanks to the technology uh, available jobs, they're going from 15,000 to 80,000. And they're doing it. So uh, there's lots of good aspects, uh, you know, depending on what you, you hear often, AI and others are taking jobs, but there are also many opportunities. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question as we've got you here. And I'll be kind. He hates politicians, I can tell. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Actually, no, um, firstly, thank you for uh, your work on um, the digital transformation. That was, that was very strong. That's really helped the city. Um, but my question is, as education is expensive here, very expensive, how do you persuade someone to take that philosophy course, to take the course which is not a direct job? I think, uh, along with the earlier answer on the CV, a person who's well-rounded, I think, is as valuable as somebody who can co just code or just do the type of one track. You do need a broader sense of yourself and of the world. And I think that makes you a better networker. We hear constantly, I mean, obviously, I'm a big supporter of CUNY, the City University of New York, and uh, most of the students have a background that enables them to uh, get a full scholarship or partial scholarship, and they come from all over the world. My class has, out of 20 students, probably 10 or 15 countries. 
So that's the great thing about CUNY. So I think the answer to your question is, it's okay to do the philosophy. First of all, you're bringing all your breadth of your background to the job, but you also need to be able to network and be able, that's a big uh, challenge for the millennials, is being able to do that extra step that helps them get into those rooms. Uh, so I have a similar answer, but maybe a slightly different uh, nuance. So I, I actually deal a lot with students as well at hackathons, and they often come up. We have like a booth set up, and we like mentor, and you know they're, they're really earnest. Uh, say these developers, and they're like, "Well, I'm really interested in physics, but I feel like I have to be a developer, so I'm going to have to like give up this minor and really focus on just development." And uh, to, to mirror what you said, it's like, no, that, that physics and the development is what's going to make you really interesting. Now you have some insight where you know, an oil company is going to want to hire you because you're going to know, you know more uh, about uh, you know, the, the specific application. And you just want to be happy in your life. Like, you don't want to do something just because it makes money. right? Like, you want to find that sweet spot of like, hey, I'm interested in this. I can spend a career doing it. Um, and then on the other side, if, like, if someone's not going to be a developer, right, uh, but I think tech literacy in general is the biggest thing, right? Like if, you know, every tech company, every company's a tech company, every company's a media company now. And even if you're not going to be doing the programming or the, you know, IT administration, you should know about it. You should know enough that you can work on a team with those people. And you know, again, there, there there is going to be you know, right now is a really sweet spot for developers. It's probably for ununionized labor, they have more power than any other worker in the world right now. Like really, developers are interviewing the companies, right? Not the companies interviewing the developers. And you know, that may change over time. It'll, but I think tech literacy for the general population is huge. And uh, I agree that like actually being well-rounded, not just a computer programmer, but a computer programmer that follows your own interests and now you're like law as well like law like natural language processing and uh, is going to like you know re is already you know coming into legal things so if, if you know about law and development there you go you know if you know about chemistry and development there you go so i feel like combining the interests really does give you power and again if you're not going to be a developer just knowing about how to work with developers and how to work with technology as a team uh, is super powerful so I'm going to ask you about your team, uh, your team inside IBM. How much crossover is there? How much uh, people from different uh, industries is there at the moment? I mean, uh, oh, it's, in, it's 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 incredible. It's all over the place. I mean, there's a joke like you know the like IBM our logo is like a B like IBM. There's this from the 1960s a famous design, and somehow that's how I, I feel about IBMers. It's like you just they're, you're not sure exactly what they're doing, but you meet them. Like even here tonight, I, I, I chatted with uh, David, and I, I liked him because he had uh, the same neon Nike, but he had it on his glasses. And oh, he's he's an IBMer, you know. So it, it's all over the place. Everything from open source technology to fintech to, you know, even on my team. Let me mention this. This this will this is amazing. Um, my team in the last year and my current team, we have a high school and a college dropout, right? But they can do the job. And you know, IBM and I believe Microsoft and Google both have, uh, I don't know about Microsoft, but I think Google has recently dropped the college degree requirement because it is really about being able to do the job and do the role. And uh, yeah, there's, you know, the other thing too is people outside of, you know, so yeah, we're developers, yeah, we're technologists, but also like I'm into, you know, music and entertainment and animation and all of these things. And I think that also brings something, you know, to the culture of, uh, you know, and, and understanding markets. So this is, uh this is, it feels like it's something that hasn't been stifled in your team. You're very creative. And that was never a problem? Um, well, I, and this is funny. The, I was actually uh, joking about this earlier in, in uh, our video interview, is you know, how disruptive can you be at the moment? And I feel like it's also being respectful and understanding the situation and finding the way to you know, listen, understand, know what's going on, and then inter introduce just enough disruption. But Actually, I've been pretty happy and have actually taken a lot of risks and tried a lot of things, and maybe not all of them worked out, but uh, there's been enough of you know positive result that I get enough rope, you know. Yeah. yeah. Seb, you've got a fantastic story, Do which I? I'd love to. I'd love to okay. get you to repeat. Um, I don't know what my fantastic story is. Um, so I'm actually 
pretty close to this space, as I only graduated a few years ago from university. Um, I know my current role actually did require a master's degree, and I don't have that. But what I did have is kind of a very broad uh, background. I did um, kind of, I majored in computer science, but I did a concentration in user experience and digital design. So I kind of had the arts and technology background. Um, and also, unlike, I, I mean, it's a stereotype, and like obviously it's not the entire picture, but a lot of the traditional idea of developers are people that aren't really comfortable speaking at like public settings or like broad tech talks and things like that. Um, and what I did in the Microsoft Student Partner Program was just that, because it was like a cloud advocate, but just on campus. Um, and so I like, as a student, I, I attribute it to my like creative background. Um, I was speaking a lot on like panels at the university, and I was running events at the university and doing a lot of talking focused things. And so when I was going through my interviews, um, not just at Microsoft, but like everywhere, it was very much so like I, I had this multifaceted background, and because of it, I got to be a little bit more picky with what companies I wanted to interview with and then accept a job at. Um, and it was very much so like me interviewing them as much as they interviewed me. Because for me, I, I had learned kind of quickly that my experience throughout my life brought something unique to the table, just as like any other, anybody else's experience would bring something unique to the table. So talking to someone that's been 30 years in their career doesn't mean that they're that much, like so much better than the person that's just starting off their career. Um, because they can both have perspectives that they're bringing to the table, especially when you're talking about technology, when it impacts everyone. Like, it's going to impact everyone that uses it. And that can range from zero years to their career, just graduating university, to like 30, 40 years out. Um, so because of that, I, I think it's great to study creative things and definitely find the marriage between technology and creativity. Um, I think that, personally, I think, I'm not sure why it's not already there, but I think the education system in like high school is gonna end up incorporating technology as one of the core, like math, English, science, there's gonna be a technology one, because just like you were saying, it's gonna be more about the marriage of both industries, chemistry and technology, um, law and technology, than it is going to be just specifically technology. And a follow-up question. Um, why did you choose Microsoft? I mean, I know we're in the Microsoft headquarters at the moment, so say nice things. But why, why did you choose them over other, another company? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of my experience has been like been in the right place at the right time. I went to university in New York City, so I got a lot of opportunity here. So when my like resume was going around and it was circulating like job fairs and LinkedIn and things like that, I kind of had like a, a fancy background. It was like art, science, technology. Like the, it looked nice on paper, and because of it, there was a lot of companies that were like, "Oh, we want to." I actually, I know it's like super terrible to say, but I actually didn't have to apply to any job. And like the only interviews I took were interviews that like people contacted me for because I was doing like freelance and consulting um, as an independent. I I wasn't like running to find jobs. It was yeah. It does sound awful. I know it is. <laughs> well, like I hate saying that because like I know it's very difficult to find jobs, and I like all my friends have a really rough time. But I I, I was lucky in that sense. Um, but the reason I chose Microsoft is it is one of the top companies right now, like the big tech companies right now that doesn't have a scandal in the news. <laughs> um, we have a, a, like a, a super great CEO. He's like really valuing like compassion and genuinity and like work-life balance and that's super important to me. Um, I wanted to be at a company that didn't view their company as the end all to their employees' lives. Like they didn't have like sleeping pods in an office that it expects me to like sleep in the office, like I don't even have a desk at this office, so that means like they don't expect me to be here. Twenty, I work full time remote, so I can work from wherever I want. And this is a, a sort of follow up question to the whole panel. What would you what would you do to change New York? Obviously, we're in New York City. To help, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. That's a hard 
Yeah, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, what would you do to help, uh, help students now in New York? You can change the education system, the, law, you know, the laws, whatever you like. It's open. What would you change? Small, another small question. Also work at a relatively scandal-free company, IBM, yeah. which is great. Um, so the, one of the things that IBM is actually doing is we have this, uh, is this better? Double mic. Double, double triple mic. Um, is an initiative called P-Tech, where we uh, have high school students uh, go on an accelerated track through high school vocational training and then actually land a job, including internships with IBM. And I think that, that that form of education versus a more formal four, six, seven year education is something that I would like to see more of. Can you describe it in a bit more detail? Um, so it's basically a, it's a very pragmatic combination of high school and, and hands-on on-the-job training, including mentoring from seasoned professionals. And um, the reason why I like it is that it gives you, it gives you a, a more blended experience. And it also shows you that academic education paired with realistic hands-on education will most likely be the rest of your life. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so uh, whilst I've been out of high school for a little while, um, I last year I did a six-month online course in machine learning using Udacity, which is an online learning provider. And I, you know, it's weekends for six months. Uh, but I, I think that, that that level of either interlaced education or bursty three, four, five, six months throughout your career is going to be the new normal. Mm -hmm. So to your question, what would I like to see or what, would, what could New York do to make that more uh, accessible is the environments that enable this kind of interaction between professionals via either formal programs like P-TECH or uh, almost like a we work or we study mm -hmm. where you can go for a few months and learn a new skill, but again, in a bursty, not multi-year format and without incurring huge debt. Because the other thing that I really liked about this online course, it was $1,000. And I did learn hands-on a lot of very useful skills that I use every day. So there's, there's also a lot of free courses out there. And there's a lot of free Which courses. Yep. Uh, and uh, so that's the, I think that there's a huge disruption that will come to higher education. Uh, the, the cost, the student loan crisis, the format itself of having basically an invariant four-year course. In AI, four years is a long time. It is. Uh, a long time. And uh, you know, the first bubble, or the second bubble I went through, the dot-com bubble, took about 10 years to fully form and then, and then blow up. So if you were a travel agent in 1995, everything was fine. And then in 10 years later, Google incorporates in 04, and your world's gone, right? Uh, AI, I think, moves two to three times faster. So having something that takes four years to complete is problematic in its face because you're not going to be able to react to the black swans that are coming, you just don't know where and what they're going to do. So having a higher high frequency cadence where you learn on the job, with the job, with school, and then learn interstitially throughout your career, I think is uh, a more useful concept. Enabling that through alternative environments where you can do that learning would be, uh, I think, a very powerful tool for a city like New York to enable that. That's it. Oh, Neil, I've, God. I'd, I'd love to hear what you're doing. I know, but this is like fantastic. a question like none another. We have 1,800 schools, about 50,000 teachers, and 1.4 million students, just in uh, pre-K to 12, and then you have the CUNY system. So I guess just a couple of things on the tech front. I mean, every school should have, have a social worker. That's a, a non-tech issue, but that would help on many levels. But the issue of tech, I, I spent a great deal of time on this topic. Um, even things, the, the bandwidth coming into these old schools is challenging. If you have four or five schools in a building, which many of them do, the bandwidth can be slow. If the teacher has said, let's do videos based on you know, some lesson plan, that's a problem, to be honest with you. Um, every five years, you know better than I in the audience and the panel, you need new equipment, new hardware. And uh, Reso A, which is the capital funding that uh, allocates for the students, or it comes from the school itself. But you can only do certain kinds of 
hardware. It has to be in a cart. It has to be networked. It has to have a shelf life of at least five years. It's crazy because uh, Chromes don't have, cannot be purchased, and nor can an independent uh, laptop because it is not networked and it doesn't have a shelf life of five years. So you know it's hard on the schools, and then you have the teacher issue. And let me give an example. Only last year, and it's thanks to the president of Hunter College, could you be licensed as a CS computer science teacher? You could teach physics and be a physics license and teach computer science. So only recently, like last year, did the State Department of Education, after us fussing for many years, uh, allow and permit and, and um, license computer science teachers. So that's a brand new license. Um, some people are happy teaching out of license, but there's another, anybody here who wants to do that and you are a computer science, you can now teach in the public schools. So, so, but you couldn't before. That's another challenge. And then there are many students who are interested. I know, I want to say, give a big uh, hurrah to IBM because the P-TECH school, P -tech schools are fabulous. Fred Wilson, who's a, somebody you know as a wonderful uh, BC uh, angel has got schools that he's working on. He's put in millions of dollars of his own money to try to make these schools work. And it's, it's hard because you have all the human element of the student that goes into it, which the social worker, teacher, et cetera, have to support. So I think we, the other thing on the CUNY side, I know there's some discussion as we get a graduate of CUNY to maybe also make sure that he or her has some aspect to uh, computer science in his or her background, because then that would give her or him a leg up in the competition with all the other private colleges that exist. So that's been discussed as part of the CUNY system. Um, so you know, the, I could go on and on about the public uh, wonderful school system that we have, and it is wonderful, but these are just some of the challenges with uh, 1.4 million students. So I'm gonna, I've got a follow-up question for you. You have an audience. You have an audience of some pretty big uh, companies here, technology companies here. You've got some people in the room who can make things happen. What, I feel like uh, tech companies should be stepping up and they can certainly give the hardware, but what else could tech companies do? Put them on the spot. No, I will. I mean, just to, Apple's been trying to get the, this, uh, Directive 10 changed, which mandates that every uh, instrument has to have the shelf life and has to be networked. So we need to get rid of uh, that particular uh, Directive 10, which is at the city controller's office. I have to say, I want to give um, uh, the P-TECH world and IBM a lot of credit, because I do think that picking a certain group of schools one of the challenges is you got aviation, you got automation, you got green careers, and I could go on, even in the arts. You got these schools, but does the school curriculum match what the industry needs? And I think there's still a big disconnect there. So that's where we could be helpful. If you have the kind of uh, interest in adopting a school, I think that that would be something that would be very helpful. It's not necessarily funding so much as it is the expertise. Because as good as these teachers are, you know, keeping up with what the job market is specifically as opposed to theoretically, there's a big disconnect there. So I, I would say that that's where the need is. Thank you. That's great. So the first thing I would do is fix the subways. <laughs> fix the subways, add some new ones. It will never happen. Never happen. It will never Flying happen. cars, maybe then. Um, so let me say, the P-TECH thing is real. I've worked with several P-TECH people, have a P-TECH person on my team now, and it's legitimate. Like, they went through the high school, got the, like, associate's degree out of it, and, like, have now been working their way up through IBM, starting off as, like, administrative, now moving into something a little more technical and dealing with, like, some real business that's going on. So it is real, and I would definitely, yes, see more of that, more types of schools like that. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, do a lot of hackathons. And a lot of their, uh, in a lot of hackathons, a lot of these students maybe have never met someone who works at a company that they might want to work at. And just that, like coming up to the table and shaking your hand and them telling you what they want to do and, and you giving them a little bit of advice, like even if the advice wasn't, they forget it, just that interaction is super valuable. So I really like just, you know, 
again, it doesn't matter if what comes out of the hackathon is a startup or, or solves anything. It's, it's, it's process over product. And uh, you know, so I'm really into doing as much of that as possible because already I've seen it like CUNY, uh, Queens College, Hack Attack. Like there was this kid, he shows up, he has no, I don't know what to do. I'm like, you know, whatever. And then, you know, two hackathons later, I see him. He's winning second prize. He's got like the whole crew with him. And you can see it was like, wow, this series of events has changed that person's outlook on life. You know, so. And uh, what, uh, what students are typically there? And then who's missing? Who should be at these hackathons but is is not there? Well, it's that's a really good question because uh, something else I've been thinking a lot about is it's not just the developers. So it definitely, it's a lot of developers, kind of developers first. But part of that, like knowledge of technology and and sort of uh, tech literacy, I think especially now we need to see more designers, right? We need to see more business people who learn about the tech. So that, because there is a huge disconnect now, I think, just in every industry where business people want some kind of result, the engineers hacking away on the thing, and really what it is is you need everybody to know more about that technology. And, uh, you know, just one little thing here is everyone's looking for this general purpose AI that's going to make everything easy and it's going to be like the movie Wally and you don't have to do anything. And I actually think that the, the AI revolution needs to be driven by people. We need actually, it means that you're all going to have to learn more about math and machine learning and data science. We're not looking at a future where AI is going to make it less technical for it to even happen. It's not like there's nothing and then there's this, you know, Terminator shows up. We, we, it's actually going to be everybody needs to learn more about all of it, especially on the design and business side. It's not coming next year. Seb, what do you think? So that question actually was what the follow-up question for him was what I was going to talk about. I think in New York, especially in New York City, is like my favorite city here in the US. Um, I love it. I feel super comfortable here. Um, it's a bubble, unlike any other city that I've been to in the world. Um, I think it's fantastic. Can't say enough positive things. I think specifically in the technology industry, one thing that we're falling a little bit short of is kind of generalized representation for all in the technology space. It's still, as it is right now, um, like the roles of a developer, the roles of an AI engineer are still very white male focused. And being able to like acknowledge, be aware of, be conscious of those things and introduce the idea to people of all different backgrounds um, of like, female representation, persons of color's representation, and sh like showing that in the industry and showing that there are a lot of powerful people um, that look like other people than what the media usually conveys, which is like white men. Um, I think that that's something that we could do a little bit better. Absolutely. Um, it feels like this is where New York is going to beat Silicon Valley. Oh, I hope and so. It's a race. That's our space. Yeah. Diversity in New York City is what we do well. Although the panel, notwithstanding. I right? know. So that's actually one thing I have. Um, let people know where to ask questions. We've got a couple yeah, we'll, of we'll ask questions at the end. Oh, you're doing it. We'll, we'll ask questions at the end, but uh, we do want your questions. Okay. I hear my mic, but when I talk, it's not there with me. So, question number two for the audience, or rather for the, for the panelists, and then uh, for the audience to think about. What has been the most surprising thing you've seen uh, AI start to do, and the uh, sort of, the type of jobs that, um, or the types of jobs and markets are changing, the things that you didn't expect? Bjorn, you've been in the industry for some, some time. You've seen bubbles, you've seen, uh, couple of winters. Um, what's been the thing now that surprised you the most? So a uh, quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you are hands-on daily users of AI and machine learning? It should be everybody. How many of you use Netflix, Google Maps, or Amazon? <laughs> so you are. Uh, so I think one thing is that there's a big disconnect between what people think AI is and machine learning is and what it really is, right? And that's part because it's very new and it's very opaque. It's under, it's under the hood in a lot of things. And um, I think the, 
it behooves us as technologists or disruptive technologists to have conversations about why it's not scary, why it's not alien, how it is making many things more convenient today, right? Um, also not be blind to the threats and have a balanced conversation that's not about trying to wish it ourselves back into the 80s. Do you feel we're having that uh, conversation at the moment? In pockets, in pockets. Yeah. So for example, uh, there was a, a, about a month ago, there was an announcement that there was now a machine learning system that was able to generate text that was indistinguishable from human writers. And the, the originators of that code didn't want to release it into the wild. They were so concerned that it would produce tons of fake news, fake science papers, fake whatever, right? And today, this afternoon, there was an announcement from the MIT Watson lab that we now have a machine learning system that can detect fake generated text. <laughs> so I think the, we, should be op, we should be optimistic about the fact that this is a very rapid, it's a, it's a jungle of ideas. It's very rapidly evolving, but I don't, I don't see it as ending in a Terminator machine. Um, and one of the reasons I've worked at Watson is because I wanted to be able to pull the plug out of the wall before it did. Um, so you're saying there won't be a Terminator, but... But, and, yeah. uh, uh, the, so, so the, the idea is that twofold. There, there's a natural evolution of things that are kind of scary and concerning. And then there's a counter evolution of things that eat the scary things that are also mechanical. And secondly, I think, so you, everybody's familiar with memes, right? Those are the internet things that travel quickly. And so mimetic evolution is how these ideas evolve. And I think that something that I thought of is that if, if you got an email today that a Nigerian prince wants to give you a lot of money, you would probably not fall for it. I, I got that email. Yeah, you got that. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. And, and because it's a very old meme, right? And, it, and we've developed an immune system to it. Everybody knows that that's a scam. Now, there are new things now, deep fakes, videos that look like they are a politician, but it's really fake. And not many people have an immune reaction to that yet, because it seems so credible. But I think that, as a society, we'll evolve an immune system that will also go, I don't believe that, because I think it's a deep fake. Do you think this matters, though, where uh, we have uh, politicians who are fake, and uh, news which is pretty fake, but it's being created by people? Right. And there's, but just like we have developed, or have to develop, a natural skepticism, immunity, to overly biased sources, or our own bubbles that we live in on Facebook, or other, our favorite social media outlet, uh, there will be AI things that are making that are very convincing and fake, and we have to develop just like the Nigerian money scam. We have to develop natural defenses against it. This will not happen overnight. There will be people that get hurt by this. It is up to the regulators and the technologists to make sure this doesn't go completely rampant and start a civil war, which it has, in you know, in Africa and Rwanda and Europe and pockets in and so on and so forth. Uh, so there is disruption coming. It is up to us to keep up with it. Many smart people are building machines that eat bad machines. Mm. And uh, overall, this will be, you know, this will not be completely easy. But I'm very optimistic about our ability as humans, as engineers, as politicians, as educators, to keep up with it and develop this immunity uh, and this resilience, just like we have for against bugs in our environment. Gail, it sounds like you've got the hardest job in the world right now. No, oh, the mayor has a harder job, I think. How, I don't how, know how well he's doing it, but yeah. he has a hard job. <laughs> he's my friend. He calls me conscience. So. Actually, there's got to be a story behind that. There is. <laughs> so what is, what is um, well, what, what are you doing to try and guard against things which are scary? I mean, how much regulation do you think is needed in New York? Well, there's so many aspects. I mean, the issue for the city is, yes, all the cybersecurity, which I know every company has to deal with. Um, we have 300,000 employees in the city of New York. So, you know, it's scary because of the personal data and all the systems and so on that those of you on the panel know as well as I do and in the audience. So we're all trying to figure that part out. Um, but I want to say that from my perspective, how do you use the algorithms, the AI, the data to make lives better for people. That's what the government is supposed to be doing. It's not about money and revenue. It's what are we going to do to make people's lives better. And the hackathons, I love when I go to the high school hackathons too, because you see students trying to do the same. 
So uh, with city government, I think using IBM uh, and Watson with food stamps, also known as SNAP, there was a big improvement. How can you get people food? Because a lot of people are hungry, a lot of food insecurity. How can you get people food stamps, also known as SNAP, without them having to come to brick and mortar? In fact, how can you do a lot of things so can that you, people don't talk, come to brick and mortar? Can you talk more about how, how uh, you're using Watson there and what that relationship looks sure. like? Sure. My understanding is that there are, you know, just to give you an example, our Department of Social Services services 3 million New Yorkers uh, a year, and that's a lot of people, and they have a staff of 18,000 people. And one of them is, how do you get food stamps out? And God knows that's important. So the question is with um, making sure that millions of New Yorkers have access to them and are not uh, able to figure out how to both apply and then uh, make sure that they're comfortable applying because there's a huge stigma to food stamps. So you know, the question then is, how do you get the card? How do you go to the grocery store? And you do it without having to go to a place that is usually open 9 to 5 when you are working and when you cannot get there. So you forego eating often, literally. And your family foregoes eating, literally. So that's an example of, they thanks to Watson, and that's exactly what happened. They were able to figure out that 75% now of people who get food stamps are not going to any brick and mortar. They're doing it either... Um, from the comfort of their home, if they have uh, access to a computer or a library or places where they can get access just to something that's online. And the panic of, oh my goodness, they're going to cheat. Oh my goodness, they're not going to, uh, they're going to rip off the government is simply unequivocally not true. And I think part of it was because of the work that was done at Watson and because people tend to be more honest than the New York Post or anybody else gives them credit. But I want to say that we need to do that with more services so that people can use the government services that are available and do it in a way that's comfortable so that they actually use them and not have to go to brick and mortar, because they don't go. This is a fantastic story. I think we should be thinking about this quite deeply. I mean, yes, it's a great advert for Watson, but it's real people who are affected, real New Yorkers. Um, I'm going to stick with you, and I have an Again, you have an audience here. You have an audience of people who know technology, who know some of the smartest technology out there, some of the most cutting edge. Um, what three things could people solve for? What would, what would you love to solve? Well, you have 60,000 homeless people. Uh, right now, 23,000 children. You have uh, very little affordable housing. So how we could figure it out uh, you know, that would be my number one, that is the New York City's number one challenge, and we're not doing too well on solving it. You know, how do you build housing that's affordable? How do you find the right combination so the owners, the developers can make money at the same time? Housing for the poorest New Yorkers is right now not available. So that's our number one challenge. Um, another one is the issue of saving the small businesses, the small businesses where you have an those of you who buy online, thank you. OK, but damn it, you should buy local, I'm just saying, because then we don't lose our mom and pops. Um, but on the other hand, people are going to buy online, and the rent's going to go up, and the property taxes get um, passed on. So I don't know if this is an AI issue, but these are the issues. And I think the third is the education, you know, which we talked about a little bit. Fantastic. Thank you. So everyone in the room, you've got a challenge. Start thinking about these things. But. Uh, how do how do uh, how do the people in the room work with local government? How do they work with you? Well, it's interesting. My friend uh, started a uh, meetup, so I asked him, "What do you like about government?" I could not friggin' believe his answer. His answer was the restaurant A B and pending. He likes that. I could not believe it. That was his big excitement about government. I was livid. Um, <laughs> I think, I think in general, you know, people interact if you have a driver's license, and that's about it. They forget that the sanitation department, the police department, the fire department, the uh, traffic department, they're all city agencies. People forget but, that. But how, how can a tech company uh, work directly? They, they say, can, we, we can solve this problem, but we need to work with you. I hear you. I think that the, 
the education, and what IBM is doing is the best way to be involved, is the students who are coming out of our schools and CUNY need to have a more sophisticated, uh, relevant education than what we're providing. That's the one way. And then the second way is it's very, and it's hard to get the schools to do that. So you have to work through me or somebody else because when a principal hears you know, somebody on the phone and they don't know them, they don't answer that call. But I do think that the city, I, these ideas that are relevant to making people's lives better, there are people in the room, and you have to work with the, you know, the people who are leading Do It or leading the CTO or the CIO. They are available. You go to greenbook.nyc, and you have everybody's phone number. And what you do is you start with the commissioner's number. I know you don't like to make phone calls, but you have to. So the top of the phone, and then just keep dialing until you get one of them because their emails aren't there. Or you can call me, and I can give you their home. There we are. You heard it here. Fantastic. Thank you. Luke, let's, uh, let's talk about robots in New York. Yeah, I, well, I, I want to comment, and then I want to answer that question and talk about robots. And I think it's really heartening, too, to hear these stories about how AI is really affecting us that we may not see it. Like, everyone's waiting for the self-driving cars and the robot servants. But in reality, uh, uh, also, as he mentioned, you know, we're already touching all of these systems every day. You're already so dependent on these things. And then the quality of your life, hopefully to the better, is going to be as all of these things get better, right? So the, the AI revolution isn't necessarily going to show up looking like the robot, although robots can be very important. And, and you know, one of the things they always say for robots is uh, dull, dirty, and dangerous, right? Like, let's give the robots the jobs that would be dangerous for human beings or that they wouldn't want to do. Um, but then to, to parlay into your, the question here, as far as the market, one of the things that surprised me most in the last year is I watched a presentation from Blender 3D conference in the Netherlands this past year. And the guy's name, I think it was Adam, I can't remember, but he talks about AI. And he, he talks about it specifically for um, procedural workflows, say for 3D. And so the gaming industry is bigger than you know Hollywood now. And it used to be like, a street is going to cost you, you know, two hundred thousand dollars because it takes an artist like one week to make every building. Now, with procedural workflows, a smaller team can make a whole city. And what's exciting about it is there, and they have the real numbers. Three D is growing at just three D design as an industry across product, across games, across movies is growing faster than that increase in automation gives you. So there's actually going to be more jobs in the three D industry, and artists are going to be able to be creative, making more things by themselves or with small teams, right? And, and then this also, in that same presentation, which I wish I could remember the guy's exact name, he also shows a bunch of white papers where you have these algorithms, so again, for designers, where they're using neural networks and they say, hey, I'm going to sketch a purse. I'm going to sketch a pair of shoes. Give me 15 variations. Give me 20 variations. So now this is where they talk about like augmented cognition, right? And creativity and augmented cognition, not replacing the human being, but like extending what the human being is good at in like, and I know everyone that that's a common thing that we've all probably heard, but like here's real practical examples of like, no, you could be a designer and this computer isn't going to replace you, but it's going to allow you to like all those sketches you wouldn't, you know, that might have taken you three days to do to get to that refined point. You're going to be able to speed that up. You're going to be able to, like Kurzweil talks about compressing time, right? That's what this computation does for us, compresses time. But then you still are finishing it. You're still putting that human touch on the end. And I think that that's really powerful. And it also, it really elevates the human being. And it gives us like a, a path forward. And one, one last closing thought there is all of these narratives that we listen to. So from movies, what was the, the first movie? It was like To the Moon, right? Or something. Right, people, that didn't exist then. People saw that. Right? They were inspired by it. They became an engineer. They became an astronaut. So I think we need more real stories like this and more positive stories about technology and AI to inspire people to build the world that we want. Because if we're only looking at these dystopic stories and people are either, either trying to make dystopic scenarios or hiding from it, that doesn't leave us in a future that, that we want to be in. Right? We need a future where, it, and again, it's going to be about us all knowing more about all the stuff. AI isn't taking it away the responsibility. It's actually loading more responsibility on us to be, you know, to, to know about all the technology, to be able to build this and maintain it and use it as functional human beings. Sounds like our command for this year is go and make good stuff. Absolutely. Seth, you, uh, last week we were talking about uh, Operation Smile, and yeah. uh, I love the story, I love the approach. Yeah. Could you uh, talk more on what that looks like? Yeah, so has anyone heard of Operation Smile? Yeah. So 
I, I used to fundraise for them when I was in high school. Um, so when I saw this in the headlines and related to Microsoft, I was like, this is great. Um, so Operation Smile is a nonprofit, a global nonprofit that repairs cleft lips um, in nations across the world and children in developing countries and specifically. Um, and they're using artificial intelligence and smart machines and um, Microsoft Power BI, which is like a data analytics visualization software platform, um, and SharePoint, which is just like uh, like a team sharing storage kind of thing. Um, and so Microsoft has donated all of these services uh, to Operation Smile as part of their AI for Good initiative. And through it, they're actually able to like take before and after pictures of pre and post surgery of these patients. Um, and with Microsoft Pix, which is like a, um, a camera application that uses, like that's supercharged by some AI elements, they can compare and contrast the most optimal surgery outcomes across all of their patients, across all of the different countries they work in, um, and compare them with which ones came out the best. Um, and that's really cool because so surgeons can kind of compare notes with other surgeons from across the globe. And then from it, Operation Smile like takes the the top outcomes and they actually have those surgeons like give like tutorials on how to fix and repair cleft lips better. Um, and that's like a really awesome application of AI for healthcare um, that I, I was super happy to hear about when I read it in the news the other day. It's kind of fantastic, isn't it? Is it something you expected to see? I mean, you, you're around this technology. Do you expect it to be applied this way? Yeah, I mean, so when I was in high school, I did like a, a like, it's, it's actually funny, but like, you seem, I felt like I was so busy in high school, but I, I had so much more community service that I was doing and I was like working. I like, I thought I wanted to be um, a, a doctor. Like uh, I wanted to be a dentist when I was younger. So I wanted to be in the medical industry. Um, so I did like a lot of healthcare volunteer work and things like that. Um, and did you go to class? <laughs> I did. I was a good student. <laughs> um, but so I, I would have like I always like kind of thought about how technology was going to be such an important role in the healthcare industry, and I feel like it's something that you don't really hear about as much with artificial intelligence and like that conversation. It's like what you were saying. It's more about like the dystopian takeovers of robots and whatnot. Um, but like the possibility of AI in healthcare is just like, it's mind blowing like that uh, and a human can maybe diagnose cancer. I think I read this stat. Don't quote me on it, but I'm pretty sure it's right. Um, it was like a doctor, like a experienced doctor or oncologist um, can diagnose cancer at a 50 per, like early stages of cancer at a 50% success rate, but there are artificial intelligence um, programs that can do it at a 90% success rate. So, except there's a follow-up, which is that, uh, uh, especially for the edge cases, that the um, man plus machine is yeah. even better. Yeah, and I think that's the great story. Well, yeah, like because X-rays and they all are tech pieces of technology that are facilitating the doctors. So the, the doctors aren't going to be completely replaced by artificial intelligence. But with it, they might be able to do, like in real time, they might be able to conduct surgery with augmented reality in place, helping them navigate through like the, har the valves of a heart and how to better tackle like a clogged artery or something like that in real time with augmented reality or mixed reality. I think that's, I think that's great. People should talk about that more. And then people would be yeah, less afraid. More of it. positive. Yeah. And the third question. So, how should companies, organizations, and governments prepare for AI? Embrace it. And uh, anything that comes to mind. I mean, I don't think we need to. Uh, we've covered quite a lot already. Um, go on. What do you think? <clears throat> so, the. Uh, like I said in the beginning, learning how to learn as an organization, right? Um, do, do you think organizations do that well at the moment? No, I don't. 
Um, and and to, to also to what Sepp said, there is that when I when I ran a certain part of the Watson organization, one thing that was extremely fun was to interact with 23-year-old philosophy majors who would then write a chatbot over the weekend because they just did. They would ask for forgiveness, not permission. Mm -hmm. They were very creative in ways that, that were mind-blowing to me. Uh, they were digital natives. So, and, and what I think to your question, what's really key is to blend the not only experience ladder that people have, various levels, right, but also insight. And it's, if you're- Can you talk more on insight? Sure, a... so, so to me, I've met many young, incredibly impressive people that have a lot of knowledge, factual knowledge, hands-on uh, coding knowledge. They have, by chronological fact, less experience, and sometimes less insight, sometimes. Because to me, experience is what you get as you get older. And then if you work at really hard stuff and you have pain in your life and hardship and you work at it, you sometimes develop insight. But experience by itself does not necessarily yield insight. Otherwise, right. all old people would be sages and they're not. And they're right? not. And so sometimes very young people are very insightful because they had some kind of big challenge in their lives uh, and overcame it or worked on themselves really hard. So age is, an, is a number to some degree. Uh, experience is useful sometimes. Insight is almost always very useful. Uh, and blending, I think, th how can organizations win is if they optimally prepare people to use all three in, uh, through methods, processes, and tools that let all of these different contributors work well. So diversity of experience, mm -hmm of age, of gender, of color, is key because I think, like I said, the mimetic immune system, I also think in, in the terms of mimetic diversity, thinking diversity, is stable. Jungles are stable. They don't need a gardener. They don't need pesticides. Because if there's one thing that gets out of hand, something else eats it, right? If you have a monoculture of ideas, you are very susceptible to being disrupted totally. And when I lived in the valley, Frankly, I saw a few companies that were total mimetic monocultures. They had one, one way of being, of thinking, and then something else and wiped them out. If you're diverse as a company, as a group, as a team, you're much more stable, richer, and need less pesticides. And uh, you need, uh, you're much more likely to succeed in the long run, even though it's not as maybe pleasant in the moment because you have many more people that will be wildly different in their opinions and approaches. So New York needs less pesticides to flourish. Correct. It's already a pretty diverse, crazy jungle running at a very fast clip. Uh, and so the, the one thing I would say to be successful to companies or governments or cities is to, to seek diversity. And it's not, it's not the easiest way of being. Sometimes it's easier to be just totally in your bubble. Mm. Uh, but I think in the long run, it's much more sustainable and the companies that are more diverse are less likely to flame out. And if you look at the his recent history of the Dow 50, yeah, I a, saw lot that. Of, a lot of disruption. And very, very few companies are still around, right? Uh, that used to be in the Dow 50. And it, it, there's no simple answer why that happened. But in general, I think that uh, the, the longer you want to be around, the more diversity you should inject now. Fantastic. Sounds like we're living in the right city. Uh, so this issue of preparing for AI, I do want to say Microsoft, to their credit, under John Paul Farmer, has a city civics aspect to it. And they're trying to do uh, the answer your question, which I didn't do really well, like how can government and the amazing people in this room who know technology work together. That's hard because government is very slow. You have to be patient. And you it's like moving um, a very large ship as opposed to quick and technology moves quickly and government does not. Just look at the procurement system for the city of New York and then you know where the challenges are. But I was thinking that what has to happen, I think, in terms of government is the technologists have to work on problems that really need to get solved. Like with this driverless car, so we had a forum and the driverless car showed up and the people and everybody got excited. But I can tell you nothing has really happened since because 
um, you know, the DOT didn't, nice idea, but don't really need it now. And we have so many other uh, subway. Um, somebody suggested the other day, the speaker in his state of the city, that we need a five-year plan on our streets. And that's a good example. We got the, do we have, uh, what kind of bicycles do we need? Because God knows it's everything. And, you know, the delivery people have one kind which is illegal, and the other one has uh, some kind of scooter that some runner from somewhere wants. And, you know, and then you have the cars, you have the pedestrians, and you have the trucks, and you have the deliveries, and the list goes on. So, uh, and when people want, uh, you know, to be able to be safe, which is most important. Anyway, long story short, okay, five-year plan on how we should use our street space and sidewalk space. That sounds like an easy thing. It is challenging. So those kinds of problems to solve as opposed to just the driverless car is where we need to be. And the same thing with this housing problem is we have people who don't have housing, then we have people who have a house and they never live in it. So how do we balance all of that? And so those are the kinds of questions that the technologists could perhaps help us solve, but I know people like to look at individual, you know, how do we solve for the hardware, how do we solve for the, you know, the car, as opposed to the bigger picture. So and it's long and it's very slow. And do you think uh, government should be regulating AI, um, bias and data, these sorts of areas, or do you think it's not government's job? Well, the, I mean, there is an algorithms group that has just started in the city of New York, um, but we've been through like several CTOs, several CIOs, several heads of the do it. The, you know, people don't stay that long, I worry, and they, may, they need outside intervention. So I, I worry a little bit when government decides something. On the other hand, you know, uh, people have to be careful with information. Government has it some of it personal, and I just don't know the government is as innovative, and then when they're not innovative and somebody from the outside is innovative, how do you meld the two and still keep uh, cybersecurity as your top mm. goal? It's, that's hard. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> what comes to mind for this, and maybe it'll be very practical, so in IBM, I, I agree, it's, it's diversity, right? Diversity in organizations, so you have diversity of perspective, di diversity of, uh, of, of you know, different types of intelligence that you can all aggregate together, because ideally, right, that's what any organization should do, right, is it should get you know, sort of the best out of everybody and give them a, a platform in, in which to you know, have their career. But so inside IBM, we have this, uh, this idea of a wild duck, and I guess it's a reference to a Kierkegaard uh, expounding, where he said, you know, um, cherish wild ducks because once you tame them, they can never be made wild again. So especially coming in from, say, outside, uh, at, through a startup acquisition, and then coming inside, again, it, it, and I actually, I threw this out today in a meeting. I was just like, wild duck card, you know, in the sense of it's like, this isn't what we want to hear. And it's like, well, it's what you need to hear. And you should listen to me because we've already established inside the, the organization that it, you know, what you want to hear is, but there's a, is it, uh, is it, I always forget if the last name, the first name, last name is Deming, but the first, is it Richard Deming? The, the, the statistician, is it, uh, yeah, De Edwards Deming, the one who, he went to Japan, this is like the origin of like the lean startup, he's the one who went to Japan and helped the, the automotive industry build their, uh, you know, uh, Japanese automotive industry build this high quality system, and what he would say is if, you know, if your face is to the management, your, your rear is to the customer. And I feel like that's what we really need, too, is we need these mechanisms within. Now, obviously, you need an organization uh, you know, in government, in family, in, you, know, you need institutions. People need structure. They, they need to know how to interact with the world around them. But that, that system also has to be able to, to get the feedback and get, because you know, one more example about the students is, sure, I talk to developers all day. I talk to really smart people at IBM all day. But you know what really helps me do my job? Talking to that person who I've never talked to the technology, who has never heard about this technology before and hearing how they understand it and how they learn it, that's what I bring back to my job and then that's what I use. Like, not what, you know, yes, I need to do something and have some kind of deliverable up the chain, but really I think everybody needs to be looking at like what kind of value they're creating, uh, you know, in, in the ecosystem. And then again, part of it too is also finding the way to be 
uh, I borrow this term from this guy Sam Hamden from the World Summit, but intelligently disruptive, right? You can't throw a tantrum being like, you're all wrong, this isn't, this isn't gonna make sense. You need to find a way to, to plug that, that message into it properly. So Luke, we've all got your uh, Twitter handle. Yeah. So I hope everyone tomorrow is gonna be sending you ducks. You should all follow me. Everybody should follow me. My wife is so far ahead, well, I need to catch I'm up. I'm ducks. Yeah. <laughs> Seb, what do you think? Um, I, I definitely agree um, with that double click. It's, it's hard to navigate, especially at <coughs> large companies that have been around for so long um, in technology where you need to constantly move fast. It's really easy to kind of deep dive into your own segment um, and kind of like maybe lose sight of the customer um, with do you the think, drive to do like. Do you think you do? And I'm not saying you, but do you think we, all of us here, do do we think we do this? Too I much? think it's. I really try to be aware of it because my my what I've been studying, what I studied in university, and what I kind of try to practice in my day to day life is to be conscious um, with like a user experience background. That's kind of what the training is all, all about. Like user first. Um, you should always start with like the person, um, their problems, what they're facing. So. Uh, but I'm, cons I feel like very often I'm saying like, mm, yeah, like that's that's great, but like, what about like the person? Like, what about like, yeah, like that sounds good on paper, but like, are we thinking about the person that's going to be using our s product or X, Y, and Z? Um, my role on my team is actually to if engage with um, new to career developers and like technologists. So that's like people that are just starting out from like zero to five-ish years into their career. Um, and that's a very different audience than people that are in established careers. Um, and that audience often thinks very differently than people that are farther in their career. So I'm usually the one on my team that's like quacking away <laughs> about um, like, let's be more empathetic about like the person and what they're thinking, even if it's like we know what's good and what's coming and what's next, um, sometimes the person doesn't. And engaging with them and trying to get them to understand and want to use whatever technology um, is super important. Well, I, before this, um, when I was recording the little segment, um, we were talking about has, and I don't want to say it because it makes me sound like very cool lady, but it was actually a good ad. Did the Super Bowl ad for Microsoft, did people see that? The, I mean, I don't watch the Super Bowl personally, <laughs> but not my favorite sport. It's not good for your head. But they had a very good ad um, on Super Bowl, the Microsoft Adaptive Controller. Um, and the tagline was, when everybody plays, we all win. Um, and I think that that's a great application to put across industry, organization, government, companies. I think that's a fantastic closing comment. So before we get to questions, I, I'm going to uh, ask for audience questions in a minute. Um, a quick fire round, uh, then I'm going to ask for a closing thought from each of you. A simple statement, something short. But first, quick fire, and I haven't prepped the panel for this at all. Starting on the other side. <laughs> I'm going to start this side. Process we innovation, we'll start on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> OK, to change things up, I will. I'll start from the end. Yes or no? Uh, universal basic income for New York City. Yes or no? Quick fire. Yes. I'm a new basic millennial. Income. I have to say yes. Yes. Absolutely yes. Depends. <laughs> oh, there we are. Question number two. Um, should should tech companies be broken up? No. Elizabeth Warren thinks yes, but I don't know. It depends. <laughs> I'm going to say no. Fantastic. And the last question. Is New York City going to be a center of the world for AI? Yes. It already is. I think our diversity and our data-rich city will make it such. Absolutely. You don't think so? And final thoughts from the audience. Um, we'll come to the audience in a second, but firstly, final thoughts from the panelists. Um, 
One, th one comment, one positive comment. Thanks for listening. <laughs> well, I appreciate that folks are here. Disruptive technology is needed in government because we are not solving our problems in a way that is best for urban America. 80% of US live in urban cities. We have got to find a way to address the challenges that I think you're all aware of. And I think AI can help. Thank We're you. Uh, you don't have to become a computer scientist, but wherever you are, whatever you're interested in, pursue just getting deeper into how AI relates to that. So you sort of, we can help build this positive narrative uh, and, and we have like a, you know, less dystopic, more utopic future. Quacking about again. I think the most important thing um, around using technology, being with technology is to continuously, and I've said it on this panel a few times now, but be conscious um, about the work that you're doing and how it's impacting others around you and how to include everyone because everyone brings something unique to the table. Um, and when we're talking about technology, that's what we need to consider and that's what's gonna help transcend where AI is going, where technology is going. All Thank up. you so much. Can we uh, have a round of applause for the panel? So, questions. Let me see. I'll go to the front first. I'll run the mic around. We actually have two people. Oh, we have mic runners? Um, runner. Two mic runners. Great. And then Nina. So we need that oh, love yeah, that. We need you back. Thank you. Oh, right. I might be off. Yeah. I need the mic. No, I have it over here. I'll just talk like this. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, first of all, thank you so much, guys. Um, that was very interesting. Um, it's not really a question, rather I'm very curious to hear your opinion, and particularly Gail. Um, so I'm reading now a very interesting book, I don't know if you've heard, it's called uh, Utopia for Realist. It's written by a Dutch uh, historian. He talks about a lot of futuristic ideas. One of them is universal uh, basic income. And um, actually, I think one of the democratic candidates is also running on that. So, um, and the idea behind this is that the technologies are so disrupting uh, our economics, legal, political system, that we don't even realize it today, but going forward, they're becoming more and more obsolete and need, need to be uh, modernized uh, along with the technology. And so that's kind of the idea behind this universal basic, basic income that everybody should have, given that automation is happening and AI is here. Uh, so, Do we have a question? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question is, what are your thoughts about it? Do you agree? You don't agree? And um, anything else? Any bonus? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the panel um, in the quickfire were for universal basic income on the whole. Um, so maybe I'll rephrase the question, if I may. How soon do we think it might come? Well, I mean, it's a fact that if you're poor, you you know you you bring money in some sense because, on the other hand, if you are poor, you could in fact end up making more money if you had universal income. Let me give an example: when the ha night uh, housing, I'm sorry, when the uh, homeless services pay somebody's apartment, it can be four thousand dollars a month, right? That's your money. And it would, it's crazy, why not have a situation where they could have a salary and then they would find their own and it would not be $4,000 a month because that owner sees the city coming and is gonna up the price. Um, also, um, if you add up the benefits that individuals get often because they are low income, they add up to a lot of money. That's good because it keeps that person going and it's not much income for them actually in the end. But it ends up, in many cases, the government is paying more than if you were just paying that person a salary, essentially, and they would go out and get their own uh, support mechanisms. Do you think it's needed in the next two years, five no, years, I think ten it's years? No, I think it's a long way off. It's also city, state, and federal. It's not just yeah. a city issue because the funding now is city, state, and federal. For people who are poor, food stamps are 100% federal, as an example. So it's a very complicated 
unpeeling of the onion, and certainly controversial, I'm sure. But I think in the end, if you look at it from the taxpayer perspective, you would save money. So I'm going to ask the, the other panelists. So working for IBM, Microsoft, I'm going to, I'm going to include myself in this. Um, some of us are working for directly for companies who have huge job lo losses coming, thanks to technology. I don't see it in five years' time. I see it in one year's time as being, being needed. Are we talking about New York City stuff? Yeah, I think we are. Um, I don't know if I see it in one year for New York City. Um, I know they're, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they're testing it in Canada right now in like a smaller area. They, they just decided to like, I'm sure it wasn't a quick decision, but th they chose a city that they were going to do it in Canada where they were going to give them a pilot of a uh, universal income. Did you hear about this? Yeah. 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 Um, and I think in a sense, something like that, it might be an easier application to go by when you're scaling it through smaller towns and smaller cities. But with a city like New York, um, I, don't, I don't see it in a year. I see it maybe five let's, or 10. Let's have a new question. At the end. Relative to this, I'm, I'm curious, like UBI. Is this like, a, a question or a yeah, statement? Yeah. Uh, UBI seemingly would require uh, some pretty heavy immigration policy. I mean, how, how do you guys feel about that? Victoria AI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> had a comment here. Can we stick to AI? <laughs> it it's less controversial. Not Fair because enough. it's not a good um, question. <laughs> uh, I, I, happy to talk offline afterwards about this because it's. There's a lot happening that shouldn't be happening. Um, let's have another question. Yeah. Uh, would Microsoft and IBM, who are perfect examples of AI, um, be willing to pick up the challenge and maybe offer incentives, uh, all kinds of different prizes for entrepreneurs who would create AI systems which would be able to identify the unique abilities of an actual individual human being, interview that person, talk to them, understand what they can and cannot do, read through everything they've ever written, etc. look at the job market, analyze everything, and eventually find a match using that person's unique capabilities and be able to advise, you talk, spoke about students and what would you advise them down the road, to be able to do that extrapolation and advise. So that this has, been, this has been built already. Yeah, um, LinkedIn does. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn does it a bit, badly. Uh, go and have a look at a company called Opus AI. Uh, they've built exactly this, a matching system which um, has eliminated bias, which is the biggest problem. There's other companies as well who do this matching already. So uh, it's in the market. It's just uh, younger companies who are doing it. But is it, this is what you were, you were asking, how do you advise students? Uh, what should they study? And how do they prepare themselves down the road? And so on. That was a major topic in the beginning. There, there ought to be tools which can interview yeah. the students and so on, and therefore, and then advise them. So this, this, not the perfect incarnation of this, but parts of this exist uh, within uh, higher education for matching students to coursework by personality of the teacher, for example, by reading your Twitter feed and seeing what you're interested in and finding out on a semantic level how that would map into a coursework, including required and optional courses. We are using this internally uh, in some parts of our HR function. There's a cognitive career advisor called Micah in our company that does something you know, related to this. There isn't a substitute for a person in career coaching. There are commodity functions that can be automated. This is true for almost any other task as well. Uh, but uh, so bits and pieces of that exist in both large companies and small startups. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves. Uh, it, there isn't, there's no magic looking glass that I could tell a 12-year-old student today, 10 years from now, if you study this today, you will be doing well. Uh, that I don't know exists anywhere, human or automated. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, have a question from the other side. So if companies, one of the things they want to do is, is this one? Um, is um, maximize share of wallet using AI you know, when you're dealing with consumers. What kind of tools are being built for consumers using AI that will help us 
to deal with you know a company that's using AI to sell to us. But there's some there's some there's some legitimate concerns with social media, for example, right? They want to maximize your persist your t dwell time on the system. The the way that does that best with humans is outrage. And so we've seen an explosion of outrage generating things on Facebook and other social media platforms because that is the most sticky thing. Uh, so how do you defend against that? Well, some regulation is needed, some education is needed, and there there are then tools that spring up that are self defense mechanisms by small startups that say. I've tagged this as you know your trigger or point video or whatever. Uh, not a, not a, I don't think there's a good like next best offer algorithms are very smart, and they're increasingly using deep learning on very large powerful systems. Um, sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's really annoying because it's manipulative or or unwelcome. Have you uh, have you found it exhausting the sort of traditional social media we've got? Yeah, I've turned, I've turned well, it off it, mostly. It's, it's, you know, there's a resilience that's creeping in now uh, because it's just getting boring, right? Oh, this is going to trigger me, or you know, you're showing me this because I looked at another cat video. I don't, but yeah, that's what he thinks. Uh, so it's, it's all about ducks today, ducks, anyway. Ducks, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, so I think that it's going to be a composite answer to your question. There will be people get smarter about this stuff. Uh, there will be startups that will defeat it actively because you want to pay for the privilege of it being defeated. And it will get smarter in the sense of that it will give more useful recommendations because it's commercially more viable. Uh, there was one company I want to mention, uh, Sentiment.io with a C, uh, with Watson Company. I've mentored them from like the very beginning. But that was one of their, now that I thought about it more, that was actually one of their goals was to not treat people like one of these seven personas. Or you end up with these scenarios like if you live in, uh, say, South Chicago, it, the ads you see are actually a form of propaganda that sort of only shows you, you know, liquor ads and, and you know, certain things, like only certain things you don't get the full perspective. And that's one of the things they were trying to do. Um, and as a, by the way, one other comment, they also had a similar engine, natural language generation engine, where you could do things like that, submit a uh, text, like, hey, here's my press release, and I want it to read with more joy or more fear. and the the natural language generation would rewrite it, similar to the technology he was mentioning. So I think he said people are working on it, but it's it's a tough sell, and and it's it it nothing solves all the problems. Fantastic. One at the back. What's up? Hi. Thank you, um, Michael Martin. It was interesting to me that the first segment of the talk about education um, focused on the youngest among us when there is a very large, very rapidly growing segment of the population. People are living longer than they ever did, working longer than they ever did, and many of the people in the second halves of their career have tremendous subject matter expertise. What advice or guidance would you give to seasoned professionals with deep domain knowledge who want to work with the young startup technologists who are in, in short tech, fintech, red tech, ed tech, all the techs who understand the technology, but not necessarily the world in which it's being applied. Um, well, just off the top of my head, I've worked with a lot of like business accelerators, uh, and I would say that's a great place to get involved, right? You can go in as a mentor, uh, using your deep knowledge to sort of help any of the companies that come through. And then when you resonate with one, you could build some sort of deeper relationship, either as an investor, or you could come in working for them, or you could be some kind of, you know, it could even be, if your expertise lines up, you might even be able to make some sort of like equity for mentorship deal, or they, they could just hire you. So I would say, and you know, there's, I think, in New York City alone, uh, or in the greater New York City area, so like New York and Jersey, there's 70 plus business accelerators. So I think that could be a great place to start. I'm uh, reinventing my career, and I've been out looking for a job, in particular in the area of AI and data engineering. What I seem to be finding is that AI is being used to disqualify me and not enable me to even get an interview. I mean, through videos, through 
uh, looking at my zip code where I live, um, things of that nature. So how do we get around that? Um, I'll, I'll start by answering this, which is to say, because you're seeing this happen, means you can also challenge it, either directly or you can, um, you can work the system for your own benefit. How can I, how can I work a video in it? And you know, where the AI, is, I guess, is being used in terms of facial recognition to come to a conclusion about me that I'm not even aware of. Do you really want to work for that company anyway, if they're that narrow-minded? I mean, I think that's the thing we've, I think that's the thing we've had from tonight's panel. We've had um, people talking openly and genuinely about how, well, open, Microsoft and IBM are especially, um, that there aren't the barriers to entry that you might think. I would suggest maybe talk to the panel afterwards, um, but I'll hand it over. What do you think? Yeah, so this is real, right? And it's, there, there is a level of arrogance in some of the most disruptive companies and startups that is also real. And there is discrimination in mortgage lending, in many other industries. There is regulation for that very reason, to, because it, is, it should be illegal to discriminate based on zip code, age, et cetera. And there is a very, very active uh, movement right now to remove bias from machine learning. Because machine learning algorithms are just as biased as their training data. <coughs> Often the training data is biased. So that is a real problem. The industry is, is starting to address it. It is imperfect, right? Uh, to, your, to your very specific question, um, I, my very first job when I grew up in, uh, my first job in Austria was I was an interpreter. I was a conference interpreter. So I'd speak and listen in English, German, and Spanish. To this day, that is my most useful skill. I help people understand each other. Some, today, it's mostly engineers and executives because they also speak different languages. I think that it, it behooves the, and we've heard this quite a few times today, justifiably so, it is important to, to be, to have at least survival tech, right? If you want to survival Japanese or survival English or survival German, if you went on a trip to Munich, you would want to know some survival phrases. Equally, you do need to learn survival code or survival Python. Maybe not Python, but survival AI lingo, right? I'm not a data scientist, but I speak their language. On the other hand, it is also very, very important, and I see very little of that today, because the techies hold all the cards right now, that they should learn survival business. And that's not happening much, right? You walk in and you talk about value propositions or experience or unique insights for, that you have, and it's discounted. So there is a need for interpreters. If you are, to your very specific question, like what, what is it that really is, gets traction? is that people that are bilingual, that speak both languages, at least sufficiently to be the go-betweens, those are extremely valuable. And I, I see that in my world. Very, very few people have, bring that to the table. Some very brilliant people don't, cannot get out of their data sciences. And some executives discount anybody who speaks about code immediately as techie or gearhead, right? So having, having both, which takes work, because very few people are natively bilingual, right? So it does take work, but I see that as a huge opportunity for seasoned executives or seasoned experienced people that are, have been either displaced or are about to be displaced to, to pick up that other half and then become, because the overlapping Venn diagram circles of that skill and your experience and this and that job career from 30 years ago, it's a very small overlap that not many people have and that is monetizable in my mind. We have a question all the way to the end. Yes, my question is about implementation. So if a company were to start building um, or start implementing AI or data science, because the reality is a lot of companies are just ready to do basic data science, how would you compose the team for that? Mm -hmm. So I come from a company that's had hundreds of data scientists, but if you were to advise let's say you were to sell Watson services or Microsoft services to a large company that's simply not built up for data analytics or data science, how would you recommend them to staff up?
for example, they would need a data engineer. What profiles, what skill sets would you say they would need to get ready to imp implement AI or data science? Well, I think it really depends on the company, but one of the things I would say now is maybe like leverage a platform, not to plug what we have, but Watson Studio really like lets you solve a lot of problems that you, you know, if you're, if you're a startup or you're not sure what you need, you could start with something that's sort of already a platform built for data science versus trying to build from the ground up. Cool. Yeah, the, 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 I've, I've built a few centers of competence for our customers, and they, a very sim similar question. We have you know, 20 subsidiaries around the world. We want to start the center of excellence. My perspective was always start with a blended team first. Who would be in that blended team? That would be two, two techies, two business people, and one compliance regulatory person. Small team, but really half and half between business strategy and techie. Because Specifically, what techie are you looking for? A data engineer, um, uh, statistician, well, it, it, a coder? That, that becomes then very specific to the application. But the data science, data engineering side, from a technical point of view, uh, the, the, the job titles change all the time, what, what those people are called. But those people that are data wranglers and data janitors <laughs> that know how to clean up the data before you train it on algorithms. And then two people that are usually a really small squ squad of five people, two, half and half <laughs> roughly. Because without the business aspect, the data scientists tend to run away in one direction. And without the what's feasible, the business strategies build flying cars. So you do need both of them in the same room from the early, earliest days and bond them so they start speaking each other's language as well. I think that was great advice. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I think we should wrap up, yeah, but I think but what I want to say is all these questions are really good discussion ones. The fireside chat is going to be in that little circle there where the wine is. And um, and it's going to be over there, and panelists can go there, and other people can go there for 15 minutes, drink some wine really quick, and hash out some questions. And uh, I think just before that, we have the uh, Microsoft Reactor giveaway. But uh, just before we do, if I could have one more round of applause for the uh, panel.